Hi, y'all. Hey, thanks for spending time with me today. Thanks for being here. Good things are coming your way. Good things are coming my way. Hey, today I've got like a variety of things I want to talk about. They're just interesting and I want to share them with you. So watch it all the way through and I've got a few letters. I've got three of them. So if you've sent me some good questions, you know, stay tuned. And thinking about it today, I bet that the reason I get up so early in the morning and get going no matter what is because I've lived in the Southwest for 40 years, okay? And in Southern Arizona, I mean, it's hot most of the year. It just is. There's only like maybe three, maybe four months where it's it's cool and a and couple months is just downright cold. But other than that, it's hot. So in, in Tucson, we all get, and Phoenix to Southern Arizona, we get up early. So if you want to get things done, you got to get up early and get them done and get going with them. And so that's one of the reasons. But, you know, did the gym and you can see right here, um, got some things done and did enjoy my morning. Oh, yeah. I saw on Prime, it's called Big Country. This is, I've seen so many movies, but this is one movie I had never seen. I wasn't a big fan of Westerns, but I'll tell you, um, Gregory Peck. Okay, it's star-studded. You know, Carol Baker and Burl Ives. It is star-studded. Do you remember Chuck Connors from The Rifleman? He's in it. Charlton Heston. It's, it's been remastered. So I really recommend it on Prime or wherever you can find it. It's called Big Country. Wonderful message. It was a thrill to watch it. I really enjoyed it. And as a matter of fact, Burl Ives, either he was nominated or he won. I think it was he won um, an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. So that's pretty darn cool. If you could telepathically say something to all 7.9 billion people on earth right now, what would it be? Something to think about. If you want to participate here, go ahead, you know where. So what would you want to say to all 7.9 billion people? Telepathically, of course, but you can do it right here. Say something. What's the one thing you would like to say? Okay. I have a letter here and it's from Holly Noel 19. Oh, she said, I just got this. It says, did you mention protection? It was from yesterday's video. And I talk about do's and don'ts. And I did mention, don't invite people into your van if you don't know them. Um, and it, she said, whether or not you believe in being armed, I may have missed it. Wow, you know, that's a big subject. Am I armed and what other protection do I have? And should you be armed? Well, that is a very personal question. Yes, I am armed. Yes, I am. And I know how to use it. I've practiced. I know very well how to use it. Do I want to use it? Heck no. <laughs> no, I don't. A wise person, a friend that I made here in, um, in Quartzsite, he said, every bullet, that comes through that gun has a huge price tag. You know, you could actually end up in prison instead of the other person. You know, if you're trying to defend yourself, it depends on where you are. It depends on the judge or 
whether it's a jury or a judge, it depends on them. Yeah, and things are kind of iffy these days. So a lot of people, I mean, if you talk to younger people, a lot of younger people, ooh, a firearm, oh no. And um, so I don't want to ever use it. I really don't. But to protect myself or a loved one, yes, yes, you do. Um, I mean, why else do I have it? Now, I also realize that if there is a, um, you know, a disaster that happens, an EMP or something, whatever, there's going to be a lot of dogs running loose. And in order to not get mauled by one, because they're going to pack up, they're going to go into packs. So in order to not get mauled, um, yes, I would definitely use my weapon for sure. But I don't want to hurt anybody. <laughs> but if I have to protect a loved one, I will. That was a really good question. I also carry um, two um, jars. What, what do you call them? Tubes, jars of uh, bear spray. Two items of bear spray. And I have a couple of um, pepper spray. I have multiple uh, knives placed strategically. Um, and I've got a hammer right up there. And yeah, I mean, there are weapons. I mean, you can use a rock as a weapon, right? But you got to get pretty close. It's nice to use. Some of you have mentioned to get wasp spray. Get wasp spray. Well, that would be also uh, something that you could use. I get the bear spray and I think it's like 25 feet. Yeah. So it's, um, yeah, you want to be able to have weapons. I never had an incident where I've ever had to use a weapon. And as far as carrying firearms, you must, you just have to Google it. I'm not going to go through every state, but you have to Google it. But I do know for a fact that in New York City and Washington, D.C., there isn't even a safe passage through. Safe passage or a peaceful passage going through. It's, it's a federal law that allows if you're traveling and you have a firearm or if you're a dealer that you can travel through. You ha There's rules you have to follow. Like some of the states, your ammo has to be in one area and your um, firearm in another, okay? And they do say usually in your trunk, but you know, I'm in a minivan, so I don't have a trunk. Well, um, you have to follow the state laws on that. You must do that. Because if you get pulled over, I mean, you could get it, you could get fined, you could go to jail, and, and, um, least of all, you could, um, lose your firearm. They'll take it. So you don't want that to happen. They're expensive. So, um, yeah, but I do know in New York City and Washington, D.C., you can't even, peaceful passage doesn't even apply. You may not. Although there's so many firearms we know there. <laughs> Obviously, right? So thank you for that. Um, question, Holly. Thank you very much. I have another one. This is from... Wait a minute. No. Okay. This is from J. Bean, 8672. This isn't so much our question, but this goes with yesterday's video. The do's and don'ts, and I think even the other one about money. She said, I saved $30. He or she, I'm not sure. J, whoever, <laughs> it could be Joyce, it could be Jason. I save $30 a week to put towards my future travels. Very good. So that's $120 a month. If you have the time, you can save. A power station, solar panels, cook stove, and all the little things you need add up financially. They do. My youngest is only 13, but once he leaves the home, I'm going on the road. So you got probably what, five years. I do quick trips now, but I long for more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fun. This will give me enough in the bank to have a little cushion too. And she says 20 to 30 is an hardship to save, but I have the time. Or you can buy what you'll need as you are preparing yourself. Small trips are necessary to know what you need. And I talk about that. That Those are wise words. If you do small trips, you can, it's like practicing. Practice makes perfect. You will know like this doesn't work. 
Oh my gosh, this didn't work. You know, when I first started out, I started out, I brought one of my futons. It was a twin um, futon. And I had two or three of them, futons, uh, big ones and smaller ones. And so I brought the smallest one, or should I say the, mo the, the thinnest one? Because some of them would be really thick. Brought the thinnest one, and I had it like over here. And wow, I had to get rid of it. I mean, I just had to get rid of it. It was too cumbersome. It was too much, way too much. And so, yeah, <laughs> you know, you just have to try things out. And it was no skin off of me. I mean, um, I probably would have gotten rid of the futon anyways. It's, it's hard to resell a futon like that. And what I did was I found, <laughs> I found a nice dumpster and I, phew, that was kind of heavy too. Phew. You know, that's the way it was. And I got rid of it. I was watching a documentary about New York City, New York City. And they even start with Henry Hudson, the Dutch. Yeah, they come over here. Well, they were talking, they got to the part where they were talking about the Brooklyn Bridge. John Roebling built the, um, the uh, Brooklyn Bridge. And it was, Brooklyn was a city unto itself at that time. And there were ferries that used to go across, but Manhattan was getting so crowded. I mean, it's just this island. It was so crowded that they they knew that they had to get this bridge built. Now, it took a while to do because they had to get the money for it. And they had to convince everybody to, the, you know, the government, the city council and everything to put the money aside for this. Well, they contracted John Roebling. He was an immigrant from Germany and he was an architect. Let's go back to Cincinnati. <laughs> I lived there for a couple years and I was a nomad there for a couple years. Well, in, let's see, December 1st, 1866, they called this one the John Roebling Bridge. It connected Cincinnati, Ohio with Covington, Kentucky, right? 1,057 feet. Now, it was literally the prototype for the Brooklyn Bridge. I've walked across the Roebling Bridge. I've driven across the Roebling Bridge. It was the first bridge to connect Ohio and Kentucky. Unbelievable. I've walked across it. It was amazing. The, it, there's a lot of ornate little details there. But it looks almost exactly like, if not, the Brooklyn Bridge. The Brooklyn Bridge opened up May 24th, 1883. And the, the, the John Ro they actually named the bridge after John Roebling. But in New York, they named it, at, they called it the Brooklyn Bridge. So 1883, and then the John Roebling Bridge was 1866. So, yeah. Now, there in Cincinnati, well, it's really on the Kentucky side. There, um, he had his offices. Um, John Roebling had his offices. Now, and I've been there. It is so cool. Um, it's called the John Roebling Cafe. Yeah. So it's very, very cool. Very nice cafe. Just enjoyable. They got tables. They still have old things there that, you know, old mementos. Mm -hmm. Pretty darn cool. And now the Brooklyn Bridge is 1,595 feet. So, well, it took a long time to get that Brooklyn Bridge finished. Oh, my goodness. Well, the thing is with the Brooklyn Bridge is John Roebling. He was, situ <laughs> he was situated in such a way that something moved and crushed his toes. Well, back then, the treatment for that was they would do water. Well, they were putting untreated water on his toes. He had open wounds, and he did get tetanus, and he died. So his son, Washington Roebling, and Washington's wife, Emily, they finished it. Now, Washington wasn't, um, it really did drag out after that, it, it, after John Roebling died. It drug out. They finally got it finished. And 
when they opened it, they called it the People's Day. It was a big celebration. The People's Day. <laughs> it was funny, too, because <laughs> it said that um, the governor at the time made a remark. I don't know what all the hoopla is about. All they had to do is just say, the bridge is now open. <laughs> Which comes, it made me think, boy, there's so many different types of people, aren't there? I mean, there's some that's like bottom line, hey, open the bridge and let's go. Let's get back to business. I'm a bottom line person. But, you know, I think it's pretty cool that they called it the People's Day. It was a big celebration. And people were just walking across. And the people back then, they did not, they could not comprehend. They'd never been up so high. And the, it, it must have been amazing to walk across. They didn't have anything like that before. And they didn't have skyscrapers back then or anything. This must have been amazing. And then they had fireworks um, that night, which reminded me of in Cincinnati. I was thinking about bridges and they called it the People's Day. Well, in Cincinnati, there's now like there's a few um, bridges that go that connect Cincinnati with Kentucky because it's just more traffic. They got to um, have more um, to get the traffic through. But there's one bridge. It's called the Purple People Bridge. It's just for people. That's how they walk across because there's like walking across the Ohio River. And it's like they go from like the stadium in Ohio, maybe to see the... Um, the Red Sox, and, and then they go across maybe to some um, bars or restaurants or whatever in Kentucky, but they can walk across. It really is painted purple. I found that amazing, the uh, Purple People Bridge. and But they did name this the People's Day. I just thought that was really interesting. Yeah. Well, what else about the bridge? Okay, let's continue. Six days later. Here's where I always say... Our greatest fear lies in anticipation, okay? Well, <clears throat> six days later, a woman fell. She was on the bridge and she fell. She just tripped. Well, it, it created a stampede. <laughs> it created a stampede. People thought that the bridge was, because they'd never been up those that high, they couldn't comprehend it. They probably were dizzy. And they just, that well, they anticipated that the bridge was going to fall. And the fear created a stampede. Twelve people died <laughs> in this stampede. Isn't that? So, yeah, they got trampled. Yeah, because there was a stairs going down and they were all going for the stairs. And they just started, you know, falling. Yeah. <sighs> okay. <laughs> I know. It's so funny. It's It's not even funny, but. Okay, last but not least, I have a letter here. It's from Tom Z, ZV7HF. Ooh, that must mean something, I bet. Listen to this. This is going to, um, it's a very endearing letter, and I really appreciate this, Tom. And I think you will, too. Hi, Lee. A really lovely romantic video. It's about yesterday where I talk about, um, is, is your experience as a nomad, is it a romantic life or is it a miserable ride? And it really kind of depends on your attitude. But he mentioned that, thank you for the romantic video. I do love pep talks. It's kind of a pep talk. You have the gift of teaching and sharing. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Tom. My sticks and bricks retirement life stay. Okay. Yesterday evening, a pastor of a local church called me. He asked if I could go and do a contracting job for an older couple who desperately needed plumbing help, but couldn't afford much money for repairs to their older house. I reluctantly said, okay. I had done some jobs for the preacher's own personal home in the past year or two. He had become a client. He now trusted me a lot to connect me with his congregation. Today I went. The little wife is 86 and the hubby is 94. That's so cute. The little wife and the hubby. It was a lovely little old home. She is a great housekeeper. 
a veritable dollhouse. Are you a writer, Tom? Because this is great writing, okay? She is a great housekeeper, a veritable dollhouse. Everything just so. What a lifelong romantic love story they had shared. Hubby is getting dementia now. She's the boss. <laughs> I love it. I asked her what she attributed their 60-year marriage success to. She replied, I don't know. <laughs> I love that. I did the referred sink big water leak repair, and I only charged her $45. You go, boy. Then she asked if I could go ahead and replace a really bad toilet in hubby's bathroom. I told it would be about 250 for a new handicap toilet. She said, okay. But I said, I didn't think that hubby's toilet needed replacing. It just needed repairs and some new internal parts. She said, okay. <laughs> I love it. I made the repairs. I decided only to charge her $70 for the toilet labor, labor and materials, saving her a ton of money. Hello. Oh my goodness. Then she asked if I could repair her countertop. I did the repair. Conscious of her bill adding up, I decided not to charge her anything for the countertop repair. The countertop was pulling away from the wall and wobbly. Yeah. Then, gathered my tools and I prepared to leave. I asked her if she needed a written invoice. She said, no. She's a woman of a few words, isn't she? She <laughs> She pulled out a bulging billfold and peeled off crisp new $20 bills and paid me a total of $140 cash. I suspect she has a lot more money than her preacher man thinks she does. <laughs> I love that. All in all, it was a very interesting, romantic, and profitable couple of hours. I must remember to send the preacher man a nice thank you note. Thank you, Tom. I hope you enjoyed that because when I read, I thought, oh my gosh, this is pure, pure writing. To me, this is what the juice of life is. It really is the juice um, to be able to help somebody like that. And you go get to go in and meet people. You get the blessings to give. And uh, yeah, it, what was she, 86 and he was 94, something like that. Wow. The little wife and the hubby. Thank you, Tom. Okay, well, I think that's pretty much it, everybody. I love you guys so much. And thanks for the watching the variety show. Thanks for watching it all the way through. Please subscribe and give me a thumbs up. And go to minivanlee.com. I've got the book um, link there, How to Live in a Minivan, The Minivan Leeway. I've got jewelry and I've got neck gaiters. And I do have, um, well, I do have gifts if you want to give me a gift. When you go on minivanlee.com, no matter what, no matter what, except the book, that goes through Amazon, I get 100% of everything. It's not like um, Patreon or something, they, they take out like 25%. No, um, I get 100% of it. So if you want to give me a gift, I've got different um, amounts. And uh, if you want to buy something, you know, if you see something you like, it all helps support me. Until tomorrow, I'll have some more stuff for you. Bye.